there's a number of studies that show that if we can identify this early, we can stop about or we can treat for and alleviate almost 50% of the mental illness that goes into adulthood. Can supercomputers and AI improve mental health? According to the Institute for Health Metrics Evaluation, about 13% of us suffer from some form of mental health disorder. That's about 971 million people globally, and it's only gotten worse since COVID. Doctors from Cincinnati Children's Hospital are using the world's second most powerful supercomputer to help solve the problem, perhaps at the source when we're children. Welcome, Dr. John Pestian. Thank you. Thank you for having us here today. Super happy to have you. What is your project? So we're working on the whole idea of pulling together and computing mental health trajectories. And what does that mean? Um, well, when you're young, often your, your mental illness will begin to appear. And as you get older, it kind of trajects and becomes worse. And, and then you have a lot more treatment in that. And so the whole idea is to find early identification for the start of these trajectories for pediatric and adolescents. And we focus on depression, anxiety, and suicide prevention. And those are the three areas that we're starting with in the beginning. And we want to use our clinical expertise and the expertise of Oak Ridge National Labs, again, along with Cincinnati Children's. We want to use those two expertise to be able to develop a, a trajectory of how your mental illness is. So you may, if you have children or, or you're not, or have gone into a pediatrician's office and you'll see these uh, growth charts where we measure the circumference and we measure your head and your weight and your height, and you get a trajectory of where you're going to fall in, along in, in, in growth. But what we're doing here is we're developing a mental health trajectory or a growth chart to show that how people are developing. And with earlier intervention, you can uh, avoid a great deal of mental illness. In fact, there's a number of studies that show that if we can identify this early, we can stop about or we can um, treat for and alleviate almost 50% of the mental illness that goes into adulthood. So catching it young, catching it early, and giving care is a very important part. So that's what our project is, to say it that, quickly. That is amazing. 50% is potentially what you can head off with early intervention. How does it work? I mean, we know how growth charts work, right? We see, okay, they've measured people at various heights and ages and stages and grade levels and all that stuff. How do you project out a mental health trajectory? What kind of data are you using for that? So it's not much different than, than a growth chart, but the data that we're using is related to mental illness. And so we, we go through and we capture our data that we collect at Cincinnati Children's, and we use those in order to predict um, a high, a medium, or a low likelihood of, of mental illness. And, um, and so you just kind of take those, and then you take me or you or whoever goes in, and we take your current state, so that's that's what we use. The first thing is what we use the AI for as we create these, these feature spaces. Uh, I know it's technology. We create these feature spaces of mental illness and we compute the space. And then we plot you or me or whomever against that space. And it shows that you're in the high, the medium and low. And the graph that we have that shows the trajectories would show a high, medium, low space and where you are for and maybe I came in and six times and I'm all of a sudden I'm plotting close to the anticipated mental um, depression line, it would say, oh, you're plotting close to the, the depression line. And then the clinician would then intervene at that point in time. So we're just developing a very high tech decision support system. We're not gonna make decisions. We're gonna present it to the, and the clinician will say, wow, it looks like you're following on this trend. Let's go ahead and do this care. Let's do that care. So let's, let's do the early identification. And that's how it works. Where's the supercomputer come in? Um, so far seems fairly simple, seems fairly doable. Um, growth chart, mental health chart, where you're trending, what's happening. Why do you need a supercomputer? So mental illness, as you can think, is complex. It's very complex. And why is it complex? It has a biological component. It has a thought component. It has an environmental characteristics and whether you know you've been bullied I have those social determinants and that's so you have all these features, all these characteristics that make it a very big 
place to try to compute. I'm one of the, on the uh, the U.S. Veterans um, Million Veteran Program where we use natural language processing in order to compute the likelihood um, of a veteran or prevent veteran suicide. And the model we built, I built early on, was a model, and I hate to use these numbers, but it's very big. It's 10 to the 18, which is if you try to, John, if you try to run that on your local computer, it's going to take you about a decade to compute that. <laughs> It'll, it might take it to your local university, and it might take their cluster five years. Well, the supercomputers allow us to bring it down to five hours or four minutes, and we need that to train the model. So the complexity of mental health, when you think about it, come on, when you think about it, what other illness perturbs the biology space, perturbs your biologically to get you to think differently to take your own life? Yes. I mean, really think about that. And so it's very complex. And there's so many externals, you know, in some cases, it could be the temperature that, you you know, it could, it can be, we talked about bullying, there's so many variables and characteristics that set that biology off. And then the biology keeps going and going. And then all of a sudden you're thinking about, I can't take this anymore. Ed Schneidman, um, one of my mentors, who's a founder of Suicide Research since passed away years ago, um, he would call it psych ache. It, it, it leads to the pain in the brain that eventually you want to get rid of it. What other mm-hmm. disease, what other problems, what other illness, what other symptoms leads us to want to take our own lives? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we need this computer supercomputers in order to deal with that complexity and we couldn't 10 years ago we couldn't do it they didn't exist they just didn't exist there i mean we thought about these things but now that you have these high performance computing you have more and more opportunity to test this you actually go beyond the statistics as well and the correlations because you're using artificial intelligence also Uh, how are you using that and what are you getting out of that so the, the AI or machine learning, or first of all, let's acknowledge that everybody in the world now uses AI for anything. You know? So let's say that we, we're using it beyond, you know, um, when we need our next gallon of gas or something, but we're really seriously, seriously using it. And so we use the AI to first build that space on what to anticipate on whether you're high, medium, or low, because the data are so big and so powerful Traditional statistics won't allow you to do that. Then, how do you do, um, so now we have this model working and there's constant literature coming out. How do we update the model to meet the needs of the scientific literature? So here we use autonomous curation where we use natural language processing and we're just testing it now to read through NLP art, or um, Medline and PubMed articles in order to kind of look through that and say, well, you know, this may be important to your model. Let's go ahead and update it and test it. So feature selection, testing of validation, and autonomous curation are the three spaces that we're, things that we're working with now. This episode is sponsored by Dollar Smart, my creator coin app. Yeah, it's crypto. No, it's not a scam. Buy some to support the show, sponsor the show, get weekly rewards as the coin grows or just to be part of the community at rally.io slash creator slash SMRT. Amazing. So you can update, um, I won't say real time, but near real time as research comes out and you can change your models. You can probably change your predictions and you can probably update those predictions to clinicians and people in the field and they can take real time action almost, correct? Yes, but we'll always have a, a human, well, for the near term, we'll have a human intervention that it's a decision support. It's not a decision tool. There's a big difference mm-hmm. between letting the machine make a decision and the, and the machine saying, oh, it looks like you're going to be heading into depression. And, you know, so we have to make sure that we support decisions and still keep that human intervention there. What does that look like? What does that look like when a human gets involved? Um, is that in a clinical setting? Is that in a school setting? Is that in the hospital setting? What's that look like? How's that work? So, so the answer to that is yes, it's in all those settings. But let's say in the hospital setting, let's say in the emergency room, we build a tool um, that listens to an adolescent discussion and, and we ask some questions when they come in, um, what we call, um, you know, what we call ubiquitous questions. And we ask these questions and they're all built off of this massive collection of, you know, a couple thousand um, suicide notes that I collected and then built 
natural language models off of those. And these are notes that people um, uh, wrote just before they died by suicide. So we took those and we built this, this corpus and we said, well, what are, what are important? You know, what, what kind of questions do you see? And we found that questions like, um, do you have secrets? You know, are you angry? And those type of questions were very good at pulling out information that would help us identify how close they came to that original corpus. I talked about that, that low, medium, and high for uh, anxiety, but this was for suicide. So um, in the ED, we, we had a little handheld device. It was an early thing about 10 years ago that, um, and we probably wouldn't use the same. It was like an iPhone or that. And then you put it down and, and then you would talk and ask the questions and the, and the patient would answer. And then they gave you a rank or your high, medium, or low for, for um, uh, suicide behavior and not suicide, but suicide behavior. No one can really pick if you're going to commit suicide. They can just say you have high risk. Are you doing it? So that's how it looked. And then, then the, the physicians could help and the clinicians could help use that in order in their decision making process, you know, to admit, admit this person. Um, and in the schools, the same thing is working for the schools. We, we spun it out to a, a startup company in that case, and they use it to listen to the voice. And so we were able to show that um, and we published articles that showed that when you're talking, if you're suicidal, your pauses are longer. And so, you know, things along that line, your facade, these things are different when you're talking. And so we could, um, so we could show that and you could use that for decision support in school clinics, but if, it, if it's helping listen. We also showed that um, you, there's different facial expressions in people that we've published in, in that to show that, um, that there's a, been able to see that your facial expressions and are, you know, in, are, are different. And so those are, those are all the things, how it works clinically. And we look, we decompose those, those characteristics of language and how you communicate and then go from there. So this is a pretty deep topic and, and usually I focus mostly on technology, but I want to, I want to also ask, and if it's too personal, it's too personal. How did you come to this field of study? How did you come? That has to be not first pick for a lot of people to read through a huge collection of notes that people write in the depths of despair just before they make a very life altering decision. How did you come to be in this field? So you're right. It, there's not a lot of first picks for people, but there's at this point, it's, a, it's enough first picks for a lot of us <laughs> that are working in, on this. And so there's a lot. When I first started this 15 years ago, there was just a handful of people that were interested in this. And, and the computation was just breaking open and we're talking about, can we do this? And so it was early on. There's, there's nothing. I'm, it's, it's like what you do. You disseminate the knowledge and, and you're taking what I'm saying and you're figuring out a way to tell people about it so they can understand it. It's your vocation. It's what you've done. It's what you've chosen. This is my vocation. My vocation is to find technology to make to people with mental illness to, to reduce their misery or maybe save their lives on occasion. And so I don't have anything particular. I wish I, I'm glad I don't have anything particular to say that, you know, something happened in my family member or, you know, my brother. It just doesn't happen. It's just, it's just what I'm cut to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Where is the project right now? And, and what are the next steps? When do you think this will be fully um, rolled out? So the, the data are being analyzed. We've, we've combined all those pieces of data, the clinical, the, exper- or the external data, the social determinants, the, uh, uh, the census data, the uh, environmental data, all those things. We've combined those together. And um, we're just working on now on how do we best identify algorithmically, how do we plug into the AI algorithmically, what's the best way to, and there's a lot of questions in that. There's like, you know, how, how do we find out that someone spoke, some clinician, some physician spoke about suicide in the clinical notes, you know? Mm-hmm. So you have to write your natural language processing, but you know, there's a lot of ways to say suicide. So your your natural language processing has to be trained in order to fix. So we have a lot of those things that we're doing. And we hope within the next six months to be able to to plot the first plot 
of a group of uh, patients and a group of early adopters to start plotting on where it is on, on the graph. And then mm -hmm. in there over the next, you know, maybe year or so, we'll work on putting it on the, um, the first adopters clinician's desktop where then when, when, the, when the, the patient or the, the comes into their office, they'll see that, you know, looks like you're, you've been depressed. You know, let's talk mm -hmm. about that. What can we do in order to help? So I like to say a, a year we have the first thing, and then probably it'll take us three years to learn all our mistakes and then go back and kind of redo it again because there's always, that's just the nature of science, as you know, in technology. You build, you fail, you build, you fail, you know, what does it fail fast often or things like that. So we'll just kind of go through. Um, and that's where I think we'll need most of the technology. One of the things that we're working on now is how do you portray this, this new language you're developing graphically, the whole idea of symbolic language. How do I present this new symbolic language to people um, and to clinicians and to parents and to, the, and to the patients all in a way that everyone can understand what we're saying? And it's just not a big spreadsheet of numbers or something like that. So that's going to take a little bit of effort. We have some, some folks, uh, Dr. Zinder and others, who are helping us with that. So those are the type of things we need to to get done, as you say, where are you? That's where we are, and we'll hopefully have some some good samples on the desk in uh, you know in a year or so. It's moving along fast. I'm very excited about it. Let's talk about taking this kind of technology to the next billion people, maybe globally at some point. If you can look in your crystal ball a little bit, um, mental health is such a widespread thing, uh, challenges with it, uh, poor mental health, uh, problems, those sorts of things. We I mentioned off the top 13% it was a global estimate. It's almost a billion people. And guess what? The rest of us aren't always happy and wonderful and, and, and uh, you know, on the treetops <laughs> or on the mountaintops all the time either, right? What can we build into the technology that all of us have, whether that's our smartphones, whether that's uh, a digital assistant like Siri or Alexa or Hey Google or something like that, that can help? Do you see that in the future? You know, I, I, I can probably think out with you about that now. I haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about our, our emphasis is on clinical care delivery and, and those people that are treating the patients. How do we help them? But if I wanted to scale that, I think I would scale it to caregivers. I'm not one that has bought into the entire idea of allowing these tremendously important decisions be done by a machine. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of using a machine to bring the best information to the clinician and, and the patient and say, how do you think we should go from here? What way mm -hmm. will treat you better? Because I don't, so my idea of scaling is getting it in the hands of those that, that treat people. And that clinician could be the social workers, it could be the physicians, it could be the school counselors. It doesn't really matter who it is, but there's still, I'm not ready to see that the machine's mm -hmm. going to do mm -hmm. And I don't know if I have a copy. There's just, okay. it's just, it's because it's so complicated. Like we talked about biology, environment, you know, thought, all that is so complicated. And I don't, I don't know how the machines would do it totally for us but they can help us a great deal. Yeah, excellent. Well, uh, very important project. I wish you all the success uh, that you can have there. And thank you so much for your time. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the invite.